Good morning, New City family and friends, and thank you again for joining us today for online worship. Today, believe it or not, is day 26 of our 40 days of prayer. We've called this initiative Reset for Renewal. This is the thing we're doing as a congregation. We are together choosing to resist hurry and embrace prayer for the love of God and neighbor. So if you've been with us this whole time, we're over halfway, persevere, you can do it. So glad you've joined us. If you're just now learning of this and you wanna join us, it's never too late. You can go on our website, you can sign up for the daily emails, or you can go to our homepage and there's a banner at the top and you can click on that banner and it'll take you to today's prayer. Now, join me as we turn our hearts and God calls us to worship. My name is Benjamin Kant, and I'm a pastor here with New City, and we as a church are in a 40-day initiative called Reset for Renewal. And in these 40 days, we are resisting hurry and embracing prayer for the love of God and neighbor. Every day at noon, we are going before the Lord and praying for His kingdom to come using the Lord's Prayer. And so today what we're going to be doing in our worship service, in our liturgy, in our songs, in our sermon, is exploring what does it mean for the kingdom to come? So to that end, I'm going to invite you to stand now wherever you are and hear God call us to worship this morning from Isaiah chapter 52. Hear God call you to worship. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation 
who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Join me now in a prayer of adoration and confession. Father in heaven, how good is the news of your coming kingdom. So good that just by taking it to our neighbors, our very feet become beautiful. Let us make public your your peace and your salvation. Let us bring the good news of happiness. Let us proclaim to one another, your God reigns. But this does not strike us as good news at first. If you reign, then we don't. The difference between you and us is that you never mistake yourself for us. We want our kingdom come. We publish not your salvation, but our selfies. We make public our preferences, not your peace. Set us free from ourselves. Set us free for yourself. Turn our hearts from mine as the kingdom to thine as the kingdom. Make our waste places sing like a choir. Comfort your people. Return to Zion. Be enthroned upon our praises. We fix our eyes upon Jesus. Long live the King. Amen. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed, for the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer, He's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the There's beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, the rest of those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer, He's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. So come and be chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calvary and there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary so come and be chainless come and be fearless come to the foot of Calvary and there is for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary. He's our rescuer, He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord our rescuer.
Christian, hear now these words of assurance from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It is by that name, the powerful name of Jesus, that we are saved this morning. Let's worship him together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. A hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. couldn't see heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater and what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again and you have no rival you have no equal now and forever gone you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory and yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Lord Jesus, we find comfort and hope in the fact that there will be a day when every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee will bow to your beautiful name. It's in that name that we pray. Amen. I would invite you to join us now in the portion of our liturgy where we turn towards our sermon. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and lead us in a prayer of illumination. If you would, wherever you are, stand up and join with me as we pray, asking the Holy Spirit to shine His light on His Word. 
Join me in praying together this prayer of illumination. Gracious Redeemer, as we hear your word, open our eyes to your glorious kingdom and bring us life through your Holy Spirit. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning, New City. We, we love, love you and miss, miss you. you. This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The second passage comes from the gospel of Luke 4, 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is God's word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good morning, New City. This morning, we continue on in our sermon series called Reset for Renewal. And for those of you who have been with us, you know that this sermon series is designed really to undergird the main thing that we're doing as a church right now. What we're doing is we are spending 40 days to embrace prayer and resist hurry for the love of God and neighbor. And so our desire in this 40 days is to take time to do a reset uh, for a desire of renewal uh, now and in the future. And you know, when we started this, I knew that God was leading us to do this, but I didn't know all the reasons why. Right then, of course, we had uh, and still do the coronavirus reality uh, and the COVID-19 disease and all of the, the havoc that it's wreaking, uh, reaping in our um, in our lives and in our economy in all sorts of ways, many lives lost. And we continue on in this time where we don't know what's happening. And so it causes fear in us. And now, of course, there's this great civil unrest uh, that are precipitated from events that we never could have seen coming. Well, maybe we could have, but we didn't know that they would happen now. And so if you're anything like me, uh, I am confused and I'm tired in almost every way. And I find myself, as we're praying every day for God's kingdom to come, I'm finding myself realizing uh, how much tension there is in the time we live in, that we're praying for God's kingdom to come. And yet, as we just heard in our scripture reading, Jesus said, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. And so the question is, which one is it? Can it be both at the same time? The kingdom is coming or the kingdom is already here. And, and if you've been at New City for any time, you've heard us talk about the already not yet of the kingdom. And I'll just billboard right at the beginning, that's what this sermon is about. How do we deal with the tension of the times? How do we live faithfully in the already and not yet? And one way to get at this question is to explore a very common question that we ask all the time. And that is, what time is it? Right, we may be with friends and we wanna know if we can get in uh, one more uh, game, if we, want to, if we can get in uh, another hole on the golf course. If, we can, if, you're, if you're a kid listening, if you're a child, you may be asking in the summertime, hey, can we watch a movie tonight, right? And, and the parent, your parent's gonna say, well, what time is it, right? Well, if it's close to your bedtime, then the answer is probably no. Uh, during the school year, if it's a school night, what time is it? The, the answer is probably no. And the reason is, is when we ask the question, what time is it? What we're getting at oftentimes is, okay, given what time it is, What's possible? What are the possibilities? And you know, for us, uh, we have common conversations in broader life too where this works this way, right? Um, have you ever been in a conversation when someone says in exasperation, hey, it's the 21st century. I can't believe we're still dealing with this, whatever that is. Or my personal favorite, we put a man on the moon for crying out loud. How have we not figured this out yet? What are we doing when we say this? What we're doing when we say this is we're saying, given where we understand ourselves to be in history, we have a certain expectation of what's possible. So when we say, 
we've put a man on the moon, how come we can't figure this out? What we're saying is we're in a place in history where certain things should be possible, where certain expectations should be met. You know, and so often, given our place in history, we think, well, we should be farther along. But the question would be, why do we think that way? Well, many scholars will point out that when you ask the question or when you make comments like that, you're assuming a destination. You're assuming a goal, where all of this is going. You're assuming what it means to be human. You're assuming what it means, uh, that what is good and what we should desire. And many scholars will call this the so-called myth of progress. And the myth of progress is this idea that science and technology as the engine will always take us up and to the right in every way. Now, this is an oversimplification of the historical record of, of what actually happened. But what scholars call this is uh, enlightenment thought, right? And, and the enlightenment ushered in this expectation or this era that things will always progress because we've reached a point in history where science and technology can take us on an unbroken line toward progress. But nevertheless, uh, whether or not that's true, don't we experience an ethos in our culture, an expectation that somehow things will always get better? Well, one author, Trevin Wax, helped me frame this out when he said, listen, this is what Christians claim when we ask the question, what time is it? What's possible? Christians claim that the turning point of the ages was not the dawn of reason in the 16th century, but the dawning of new creation in the first. We do not believe the world is heading toward a secularist utopia in which naturalism reigns, but toward a restored cosmos in which every knee bows to King Jesus. But when you and I are truly reflective, I think oftentimes when we're trying to wrestle with the tension of the times, we buy more into the story of progress because of science and technology and some type of social Darwinism, as opposed to the turning point of new creation. We look to the possibilities that we can bring about as opposed to the possibilities that God is promised to bring about. So we need to reckon with this. Now, the reason we do this, the reason that we wrestle with this is because we're dealing with a tension of what it's like to live between the times of the already and not yet. And oftentimes to get out from underneath the pain, we set up two poles, right? Some of us are more prone to run to, uh, in times of fear, run to hopelessness and despair. And others of us are more prone to grasp for power and pride. And this is what the first one looks like. Hopelessness and despair looks like this. In the face of fear, in the face of unrest, in the face of the tension of the times, we hunker down and we circle up into what we perceive as safe enclaves, right? And what happens is when we feel like we're safe, we circle up and we, we adopt a scarcity mindset. And when we do that, we always put our own interest above all the interests of others. And we seek to simply wait it out until things are better. Now, what it is changes all the time, doesn't it? But, but we seek to hunker down in fear and wait it out. Uh, now, on the other side, we can run to power and pride. Now, power and pride is dealing with the same fear, but it does it in a different way. What power and pride does is rather than waiting around or hunkering down, we power up and we seek to dominate others because we think swift and bold action is the safer option. Well, in our passage today, Jesus invites us to follow him in the tension of the times. Rather than setting up these polar opposites, which we'll continue to explore in the sermon, Jesus is inviting us to follow him in the tension of the times. Jesus right now is inviting you to rest in him. Jesus right now is inviting me to trust in him in the tension of the times, to trust that in him, the kingdom has arrived and the kingdom is coming. And so first, I want to look at uh, the proclamation of the kingdom, which we see clearly in Mark 1 and Luke 4. In our passage here in Mark 1, scholars will point out that this actually summarizes Jesus's preaching uh, message. This summarizes uh, what Jesus came to proclaim. So in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, we read that now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. What was he saying? Well, he was saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent 
and believe in the gospel. And so this proclamation comes with a declaration of the kingdom of God has come, but also an invitation to join in this kingdom, to join Jesus in this kingdom. And and in order to do that, of course, repenting and believing would be turning from your expectations, turning from your self-righteousness, and believing Jesus and let him give us expectations. Let him give us righteousness. And so to embrace Jesus's comprehensive message of the kingdom, it's to embrace Jesus and his offer to us in his proclamation, which is him. All right, so that's Mark 1, sort of a summary of Jesus's message. But then I wanna look more closely at Luke 4 because scholars will point out, while these are definitely different times, uh, there is a conceptual connection between what Jesus is doing in Mark 1 and what Jesus is doing here in Luke 4. So let's walk through this quickly. Here's the scene in Luke 4. Jesus has been preaching uh, around. He now has a reputation of being a pretty fantastic preacher. And he's now come to his hometown. He's come to Nazareth. This is where he had been brought up, it says. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, like seems like most Jews did at this time. Now, it was pretty common uh, in a synagogue where if there was a guest or a well-known preacher, uh, they would be invited to preach. During this time, uh, there, there wasn't a minister as, who sort of worked there full time in the same way that we would understand. But people would gather and someone would come up and read and expound upon the reading uh, that was heard. And so that's what happened. We don't know if Jesus uh, asked to preach. We don't know if Jesus was invited to preach, but nevertheless, he was gonna be there anyway. He was a good preacher and they said, hey, let's hear from Jesus. So Jesus stands up and he takes a scroll and, and he reads from this uh, prophet Isaiah. Now, after he reads, he sits down and he doesn't sit down because he's done. He sits down because he's actually about to begin. So if you actually read past what we are reading today, you'll see a little bit of Jesus's sermon uh, on this text. But nevertheless, let's, let's walk through what Jesus actually read from this prophecy. And, and starting in verse 18, Jesus reads from the prophet, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I'll just stop there. Good news is gospel. And in Mark 1, Jesus came to proclaim the gospel. And here, Jesus is saying, hey, the prophet is talking about me. This is who he's talking about. I am the one that the Spirit of the Lord is upon. I am the one who's been anointed to proclaim these things. And what is he proclaiming? What's the good news to the poor? Well, he, he's saying that he's been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, this, this phrase, captives, could be translated prisoners of war. And I find that fascinating because Jesus is coming into a battle. Jesus, this the one that was prophesied, Jesus is coming into a battle to rescue captives who are uh, prisoners of war. And he's going to set them free. Also, he's going to recover the sight to the blind, right? This is both physical sight, as we see in the Gospels, and it's also spiritual blindness. He's going to give spiritual sight to people to see the kingdom, to embrace the kingdom, and so on. And he's going to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And this would be in every way. This would be people who are oppressed by government realities. It would be people who are oppressed and marginalized because they're down and out. It would be people who are oppressed and marginalized spiritually by the enemy. Jesus comes to offer a comprehensive kingdom that brings about comprehensive restoration. And Jesus finishes reading. He rolls it up. He hands it back. And he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus clearly proclaims a kingdom. He proclaims a kingdom that his contemporaries no doubt would have believed in, but this isn't how they saw it coming. They would have thought that as soon as God breaks in with the kingdom, that will be the end of history. God will set up his reign on earth fully and completely, and he'll do away with all those people who don't embrace him. And yet Jesus is doing something different. Jesus is messing with their expectations. Jesus is messing with their expectations. And so this is still true for us. When when we hear and listen and pay attention over and over and over to the words of Jesus and the proclamation of this comprehensive gospel, it will continue to mess with us. It will continue to call us into reflection of where in my life is the kingdom of God, which is comprehensive, speaking into an area of my life where I am rejecting God's kingdom reign. 
Well, that's a question to ask, and we'll keep exploring it. But certainly, Jesus' teaching was different from their expectations. And what Jesus is saying is the kingdom is here today. And when he talks about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, what he's saying is this is a new age of what God's doing. God has ushered in this new age of redemption and of salvation. And so when properly understood, if we read the rest of the Gospels, we understand that in Jesus' earthly ministry, he inaugurated a kingdom. And that now, after his resurrection, that kingdom is continuing until one day it will be fully brought to bear. And so that is where you and I live. We live in this continuation of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. It's coming from the future. And yet it's not fully here yet. And so listen, this is what happens to us when we experience the tension and pain of living between these times, between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. Our response becomes polarized. And let me tell you why our response becomes polarized. And this is actually my second point. First point being the proclamation of the kingdom. Second point being our polarized response. Listen, because Jesus' announcement of the kingdom is comprehensive, it will always be in conflict with and confront the idolatrous powers at work in our heart and in the world. So as long as you and I still entertain worship of idols, which we do, the kingdom message will always have a very strong confrontation to it and a very warm invitation to it. So listen, when this message comes to us, it will confront us. And in order to get out from underneath that pain, we often polarize. And we see that happening right now. Now, of course, there have always been polarizing figures and ideas, but the culture that we live in right now is so fragmented because we experience polarization in every facet of life. Even the most mundane battle between, are you a PC person or a Mac person, right? And we like hate each other and we're polarized all the way from something that mundane, iPhone or Android, right? It's clearly iPhone, to, to, <laughs> to the deep and destructive lines of so-called identity politics, right? The, the church is not immune to this, okay? The church is not immune to this political and polarization of all things, politicizing and polarization of all things. Even Jesus and his disciples, look at this, Jesus will fight to keep both of these together. In discipleship, Jesus brings both sides together, right? And he wants to reshape us. That is to say, he brings together this side that we said is, is more prone to hunkering down and waiting it out, sort of thinking, I can get the kingdom of God and comfort if I just hide long enough, or those people who are prone to power and pride and say, listen, if the kingdom's gonna come, we gotta bring this thing, let's go. And so when we get afraid, it moves us into hyper action. Well, look at two people that Jesus called to disciple, right? In his 12, he calls Simon the zealot, right? So if Simon was a zealot, he's of the persuasion that if the kingdom's gonna come, baby, he's gotta bring it. And so he's gonna to go towards this pull of pride and power because the pain of the tension of the times when he looks out and sees, wait a minute, I thought, I thought we were God's people, but yet we're being oppressed by this Roman government. I guess God's calling us to do it on our own. Let's go. That's Simon the Zealot. But then he brings Levi, the tax collector, right? Who in his life decided to collude with the empire of the day by being a tax collector. And so maybe, maybe Levi thought, Hey, listen, I don't know what's going on, but maybe since I'm a child of Abraham and I'm a Jew, I get to have the kingdom when he comes. But right now, I get to have comfort. I get to sit back and I get to enjoy comfort from this oppressive government and I'll just get the kingdom when it comes. My question would be, which one are you? Which one am I? Where do you lean? In, in, where do you lean because of the fear right now? Do you lean into hopelessness or do you lean into pride. So fear and uh, pride says, uh, you will fix this, right? I'm going to do this. Or do you think, listen, everything in this culture is overblown right now. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to retreat and I'm going to wait until all of this calms down. That seems more comfortable and it'll all work itself out in the end. Well, I, I want to name these two realities, um, two common ways these realities, these polarities come about when we're trying to deal with the tension of the times. Okay, one way we can, when we're confronted with the kingdom that we sort of truncate it and put it over here or over here on these poles, one way is an individualistic shrinking 
of God's inaugurated kingdom. And that's a lot of words, but this is what I mean. Basically, what we do is we say, yeah, I know God's kingdom is coming, but what he really meant when he said that was that this is merely an, a salvation plan for individual souls. Okay, there's nothing else that we're called to. There's nothing else we can do. This is an individualistic message of a rescue plan from our sin. Now, listen, I said merely that, okay? But the, but the problem with this type of message is that you and I can believe that. You and I can believe that Jesus saves us from our sins individualistically, and we can actually believe it, embrace it. But if that is the, 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 uh, that's all we say, then we can still make a rationale for living comfortably amidst powers of injustice, amidst systemic brokenness around us, right? What we can do is we can make liberation then only about our comfort, about our security, about our safety, about our health, and about our wealth. And we play into this us-them reality that our culture plays into, and we bring it into the church. And we say, listen, we don't know how to solve all that stuff. What Jesus really cares about is saving souls. And of course he does. But if, if we truncate it to that, we lose the comprehensiveness of the kingdom. And then all of a sudden we have to choose body over soul or soul over body. But right now, Jesus is calling us to keep both together. That's what he is proclaiming in Luke chapter four. He calls his people, right? He calls us and he makes us righteous in him. He does. He forgives us of our sins and he makes us righteous in his sight. But then he takes us, his righteous ones, and he sends us into the world as his righteous ones to live as the righteous ones, right? To live in the world, working for, praying for, proclaiming truth, goodness, beauty, and justice in the world. Yes, listen, he, he changes our hearts and the work of the gospel must start in our hearts. But when it starts in our hearts, it continues on into the call of our lives in every sphere of our life. And we begin to seek to work for truth, goodness, beauty, and righteousness in every sphere of our life, in our parenting, in our neighboring, in our work, everything. And so one polar uh, misconception of the kingdom is to deal with the tension of the times by shrinking what God cares about so we don't have to care about all the things that are challenging. The second way is we actually detach the kingdom of God from the king. This is that pride and power angle. What happens, uh, as one author, Mark Sayer says, is we want the kingdom without the king. We want the benefits of the kingdom without having to submit to the king. And honestly, many movements for justice in our world borrow from the kingdom, but reject the king. They borrow from the goodness of the kingdom. They borrow from the values of the kingdom. They, they borrow from the truth of the kingdom, but reject the king. And when we do this, when we find ourselves in this side of the pole, the way we deal with pain of the broken world is to attempt to bring the kingdom ourselves. And then of course we do expect God to join us in what we think is better, right? What we think is most important. But here's the problem with this. The problem with this is that we forget that apart from Jesus, we can actually do nothing. And when we detach the kingdom from the person of Jesus, the king, it leaves us with merely a program to proclaim, not a person to worship. And when we only have a program to proclaim and not a person to worship, we begin to worship ourselves and our own programs. So we can't detach the king from the kingdom. We can't attach the person from the program of righteousness and justice. We can't attach, detach the person from whatever our view of progress is. If our view of progress doesn't need Jesus, it's not a biblical view of progress. So you see, it is Jesus who is the anointed one of God. It is Jesus who both proclaims and brings the year of the Lord's favor. And it is Jesus who has the Spirit and gives us the Spirit so that we can walk with him in the tension of these times. So Jesus isn't calling us to go build the kingdom on our own. He isn't calling us to hunker down while he does it all on his own. He's actually bringing both of these together and he calls us to join him by the Spirit 
and faithfully walking out the values of the kingdom in the tension of these times. But this is really challenging. I mean, this is so hard. How do you and I, when we feel broken and, and helpless and with despair, get on our knees every day at noon during Reset for Renewal and pray the Lord's Prayer? How do we ask for God's kingdom to come when it seems like it's far from coming? Well, that leads me to my last point, which is a path forward. So if Jesus comes to proclaim a comprehensive kingdom, which was our first point, and because it's so comprehensive and it messes with us, the way we get out from underneath its tension and its call in our lives is we set up polarities and then we go find the one that we feel most comfortable in so we don't have to be confronted in our whole life, right? So what's the path forward in the tension of these times? Well, I think the path forward is to ask ourselves the question, how do we increasingly become a people who can embrace the already and the not yet tension of the times rather than running to the polarized version of the kingdom that we most prefer? How do we do that? Well, I think we, we have to do it by embracing prayer and becoming people of virtue. Now, hang on with me, right? That could be like, whoa, where did that come from? But hang on with me for a second. I recently heard it said that one of the biggest issues with the church in the West is that at some point in our discipleship, we chose issues over virtue, right? We chose causes over virtue, right? And so what we ended up doing then is we focused in our discipleship on issues at the expense of forming virtuous people, right? We chose issues to fight for, and most of them were really good, and they were important issues, but we forgot that people will not persevere in the tension of the times unless they are formed in virtue of the kingdom. People will not persevere in the tension of this times. You will not persevere, I will not persevere, unless at my core I have been and am being formed in the virtues of the kingdom, because that will bring about perseverance. But what we did is we, we short-circuited the hard work, the long-range work, the formative work of virtue formation in the church and what we did is we just said, well, I guess we don't need all that virtue thing. Let's just find the right issues and go fight for them. But the problem is, is that when, when the tension of the times caused us to be unable to persevere, that's when we polarized. And some of us exited those issues and hunkered down and said, there's no hope. And others of us said, well, if there's going to be hope, we got to be the savior. If there's going to be hope, we have to power grab. If there's going to be hope, we have to take control. And so what happened is that rather than being filled with the spirit and having the spirit-led power of perseverance and virtue, we, we, we actually miss both. Because you see, if you short circuit virtue, you're gonna lose virtue and perseverance in the issues. But if you cultivate virtue formation, a virtuous people, a virtuous people will see truth, goodness, and beauty in the world. A virtuous people will understand that if we're in Christ righteous, then we live as the righteous ones in the world. And of course, then you'll get the issues. So th this, is where, this is where I want to end. When I say virtue, what am I talking about? Well, what are the, the virtues of the kingdom that are given to us in the New Testament? Well, if you recall, the virtues are faith, hope, and love. These are the virtues that we need to be formed in in order to have perseverance during the tension of the times while we're waiting in the already and the not yet. And this is how they will play themselves out. As you and I are formed more deeply in faith, that is looking away from ourselves and looking to trust in Jesus, what will happen is that faith will allow us to look back and trust that the kingdom has come in Jesus. Even when we don't see it, we'll look back in faith and say, no, Jesus said he brought the kingdom. Jesus said, today, this was fulfilled. That's looking back with the virtue of faith. And of course, hope is gonna look forward to the day when the kingdom is fully come, and that's what's gonna draw us. It's that hope that we're looking toward, the virtue of hopefulness, true hopefulness, where we see that God always keeps his promises and we place our hope in that. And then of course, love, what will love do? Well, love will root us and ground us in the now with the person in front of us, with the needs in front of us, and held in tension with the faith that looks back and says the kingdom has come, and the hope that looks forward that says the kingdom will fully come, we can embrace and be discipled in love now, to love the other, to love our enemies, 
to pursue truth, goodness, and beauty, even in a fractured and fracturing world. And we'll do it not in our own strength, but in the strength that Jesus did it in, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you start using king and kingdom language, it's really easy to see how we could be polarized. But listen, we have to understand what king of what kingdom we're worshiping. When you and I engage the fear and the tension of the times, we must be reminded that Jesus is king, yes, but he was king on a cross. So how does the kingdom come? It doesn't come through pride and power on one side. It doesn't come through hopelessness and despair. But love comes on the cross. This king on the cross, right, who, who out of his love gave up his power so that he could give us his power, who gave up his spirit so that we could have his spirit. Jesus is king on the cross. And remember this, remember when he was hung on the cross, there was a sign that angered the Jews above him, right? That, what did it read? King of the Jews, right? Here's the king of the Jews enthroned on a Roman cross. So you see the way forward is the way of the cross. The way to bring these things together is the way of the cross. Jesus laid down his power so that he would be raised up in power. He gives himself in love in order to bring his reign of love. And as I said, he gives up his spirit so that now you and I could have his spirit. So what time is it? How do you and I persevere in the tension of the times? Well, we beg God to help us see the wisdom of the cross and not folly of the cross. We beg God to form us in these virtues of faith, hope, and love. And we take the rest, the second half of Reset for Renewal, and we realize, okay, listen, prayer is the foundation of formation and virtue. Prayer is where I'll see God with eyes of faith more clearly. Prayer is where I'll be formed into the person who can see the trustworthiness of God and give him praise and hope in the future. And prayer is where I'll find the power to go out and love my neighbor today. So let's do it. Let's engage in prayer and let's pray now. Father, we come to you now and ask that you would give us eyes to see our failure in properly dealing with the tension of the times between this already and not yet. Forgive us for where, because of our fear, we ran to hopelessness and despair or to power and pride but would you call us forward? Would you call us forward between the tension of faith and hope to love? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring, but the promise of acceptance from the good and gracious King. I will give to you my burden As you give to me your strength Come and fill me with your spirit As I sing to you this praise You deserve the greater glory Overcome and lift my Overcome with joy I see 
Damien just called us to pray, to become people of prayer that form us for this kingdom. So how do we pray? What does it look like to pray for kingdom come? Well, Jesus has given us a template. He's given us a pattern, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And whenever this prayer has been embraced by Jesus' people as a model and as a manuscript, it's become a manifesto to turn the world upside down. And so join with me as we pray through the Lord's Prayer as a model. Our Father in heaven, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. We treasure you. We praise you above all things on earth. Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Now make it known in our hearts and through our lives. Your kingdom come. What will the kingdom look like when it comes? Well, we look at the king. Good news to the poor, demons cast out, captives freed, the dead raised, the blind see, outcasts welcome, the oppressed liberated, the year of the Lord's favor. We only flourish under your rule, O Lord of love. Realize your reign in our midst. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Put out of taste our own willfulness. Make us willingly align our lives to your will and your ways. Give us this day our daily bread. All good things come from you. 
What do we have that we did not receive? If then we received it, why do we boast as if we did not receive it? All this abundance that we have comes from your hand and is all your own. And forgive us our debts. Grant us repentance and forgive us. We are debtors to your grace. As we also have forgiven our debtors, let us seek reconciliation. Let us receive from you and reflect to our neighbors, even our enemies, the love that reconciles. Help us love. Forgive and pray for our enemies that we may be sons of our Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. And lead us not into temptation. Instruct us and teach us in the way we should go. Counsel us with your eye upon us. Direct our steps away from evil and injustice. Direct our hearts toward yourself as our highest good. We have no good apart from you, but deliver us from evil. Liberate us from the evil within us, our sins which so easily entangle, our sense of superiority, our defensiveness to protect our sense of superiority. Protect us from the evil outside us. Our adversary prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But your people have stopped the mouths of lions and stomped on the heads of serpents. We are more than conquerors through you who love us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You are worthy. You alone are worthy. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Join us for another song. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever sins and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone singing how marvelous how wonderful song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me and when with the ransomed in glory his face i at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous Savior's love for me, singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
Now, as we live our lives, as we live this faith, always in the tension between the times, we're not alone. God has called us here to remind us that we're not alone. God has called us here to give us, again, a reminder that he is with us. So receive his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in that peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are sent.